background to these problems. But uh, today's talk will be more narrow and more concentrated. Uh, and this will be concentrated on application of discretization in recovery. So in that sense, it's very close in the spirit uh, to the first talk of today's lecture session to the talk of Charlie uh, Groshenik. Uh, but uh, I will go into more details and uh, we'll concentrate more on some technique which is used in discretization. So let's go step by step. Uh, and on the first uh, slide, uh, I will remind the definitions which I already uh, have given yesterday, uh, the definition of optimal recovery. So, and uh, Mario, in his talk, uh, mentioned the same, but he used a different notation, but anyway, so this is the concept. So, we begin with the following. Uh, we have a function class. Uh, so, this is standard in approximation theory. So, we are building something which is, in, in, in a certain sense, optimal for the whole class, not just for individual function, but for the whole class. So, this is one of the ingredients. This is function class F. At this point, clearly, we do not specify what is that, but later on, it will be specified. Now, what we allow, we allow the information in terms of uh, information-based complexity theory. Our information is the function values, function values at M point. So it's up to us to choose these points. Uh, but then what we do, we approximate our function, which is from the class, by a linear combination with some functions of this, 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 uh, this expression. So phi C is a mapping. From CM, we allow complex functions. At this point, it doesn't matter. And it maps into LP omega mu. Mu, in our case, is always the probability measure. Omega is some compact in RG. So, and this is LP uh, space. And we want to approximate in LP. So exactly in this uh, norm with respect to measurement. So, and this is the worst case setting that we take a supremum over the whole class, but then we optimize both over C in the points and over these linear uh, operators. So then we get this quantity. So clearly it is a characteristic of our function class and M plays the, the very important role. This is the number of uh, evaluations we are allowed. And this LP space stands for uh, the, the, the space and the measure. Most of my results will be about uh, L2. Uh, but anyway, it's general definition. But I want to stress again that here we are doing linear, uh, linear recovery. So certainly we can do uh, a more general uh, setting when we allow, this is similar setting, but now we allow uh, uh, Fc, and this should be Xi, Fc, uh, any mapping. Uh, but we restrict ourselves to still to a linear subspace. So it is a mapping which could be any, uh, but it is a mapping to a linear subspace. Uh, and uh, usually this is convenient for us that the dimension of this linear subspace is less or equal than M. And now the setting is very similar to this and we take infimum uh, over, all set, over all mappings now and over all sets of points uh, and over all sets of these uh, subspaces. And then you get a new characteristic. Certainly, this characteristic is, uh, less or, is less or equal than this one. Uh, uh, but uh, most of the time, we will be talking about this first one. Uh, I will make just a remark. I will make this, repeat this remark later on. But in the case of P equals 2, uh, so this one, this mapping, actually coincides with this one. Because in L2, all the optimal mappings uh, on a linear space, these are uh, linear projections. Uh, but if P is not uh, true, uh, then the uh, weighted, uh, it will be not least squares, it will be least peer the norms. Uh, it will be a nonlinear operator. So then it will give us a bound for, for this one. So this is the setting and this is the, the, the characteristics which we will be talking about. So naturally, these characteristics, because we are talking about uh, uh, linear subspaces, because in, in this case, even if you not specify uh, that this uh, uh, linear mapping is from here to a linear subspace, it goes, comes automatically. Uh, it will be a linear subspace of dimension less or equal than M. So this is why it's repeated here. But it is natural to compare these, both of these characteristics with the well-known characteristics, which is the Kolmogorov case. 
So this is the classical definition of the calmographies, but let me repeat this. Maybe some uh, people in the audience did not see that. Uh, so this is the following thing. We allow to approximate our functions in the class, again in the class, by any linear combinations and how we build this linear combination depending on f, it's up to you, up to us. It could be linear, could be nonlinear, doesn't matter. But what is important that we take infimum overall and dimensional subspaces. It's written in a little different form, but this is the same. And this is the Kolmogorov heat. So it shows us the benchmark, the lower bound for all possible approximations using uh, n dimensional subspaces of the class F. So certainly this one is uh, uh, smaller than this one and smaller than this one. So these are very uh, clear and obvious inequality. So for, for sure, this one gives the lower bound for this one. And in particular, uh, uh, this is what we will be talking about most of the time, P equals two, uh, then this characteristic uh, coincides with uh, approximation numbers. This is exactly what Mario was talking about in his talk. Uh, and this characteristic uh, is that uh, recovery characteristic. Uh, this uh, is bounded from below by this one. This is obvious. So in Mario talks, he paid attention and that's what uh, the main result uh, struggled to bound this one uh, from above by combinations of these ones. So let's keep going. But we will use a little different uh, approach uh, and the bound will be also a little different. Uh, so the, one of the main results and basically uh, the main result which I will be talking around uh, is this theorem. So this theorem uh, gives us the following inequality. So we just call this this inequality. So what is that? Uh, we take an arbitrary uh, compact, so our class is a compact subset of the class of continuous functions on this compact uh, omega. So at this point, we don't need any measure for this. Uh, and this is on the right hand side. So this is the Kolmogorov width of this class in L infinity. L infinity is the same as the, the, the class of continuous functions because in our case, this, this, this is the same. Uh, but now we claim now that uh, there exists a linear method which provides this bound for this quantity for recovery uh, in L2 norm, in L2 norm. And this L2 norm is with respect to any probability measure. So the right hand side does not depend on measure, but the left hand side, the measure could be here, but anyway, the upper bound is the same. But important thing here is that N which stands here I mean, the dimension of this linear subspaces and n which stands here is the same. So here is just b multiplied by n. That means it's, if it is a power type decay, this is the same. So this is the most important part of this of this theorem, and I will explain why uh, we got this. So in the in the talk, I will give a proof of this. However, this proof and a very simple proof, uh, uh, but uh, this theorem, this inequality, is non-trivial. And why it is non-trivial? Because it is, it is based on the use of deep result from discretization, which is in turn is based on some other deep results, but the simplicity of the proof which I will give is sort of deceptive because uh, the fact uh, that this inequality holds uh, is a deep fact. It's not a trivial one, but the proof which I will give because of the deep results from discretization theory uh, is very simple one. So this is what I, I will give you. And this is the main connection between discretization and uh, recovery. So this is uh, just a historical comment and uh, Mario already mentioned results like this and uh, you will uh, see, I hope, uh, further results in, in the talk by Tino Ulrich. Uh, but let's compare this just a little bit. Uh, so one thing which is important here uh, that uh, in a sense one can say that the use of this parameters, which are approximation numbers, is more natural. Uh, in a sense, it is the case because everything is in L2, this in L2, and this in L2, and there is a lower bound uh, like this, the GN FL2 uh, for, for, for this characteristic, for the recovery. Uh, on the other hand, now, uh, in order to apply this inequality, we need to have these quantities, these characteristics to be square summable. Uh, which might be not the case. And now we know the examples. We have uh, two papers with Tino Ulrich when we 
uh, apply uh, this inequality uh, in order to estimate this from above in a case of small smoothness where this inequality does not work. So in a sense, these are two different ways uh, and uh, they complement in a sense uh, each other. So let's keep going. Let's return back to that main one. Before uh, proceeding to the proof, let's make a little bit more comments because the idea to uh, relate the recovery and some other characteristics is kind of very natural. Uh, but in the inequality which I uh, show you, uh, this one uh, is a kind of discretization. It is a re recovery based on samples. Uh, on the right hand side, there is nothing about recovery. Uh, but uh, I will make another command, uh, which was known before that inequality which I just formulated, uh, which also related some sampling characteristic, uh, the more precisely the uh, error of the numerical integration. Uh, with the Kolmogorov widths in L infinity. So this is the result by Erich Noack, and it is formulated here. And it is formulated here. Uh, and this gives uh, even the uh, precise constant here. Uh, so uh, this characteristic uh, is the optimal error bound for numerical integration with M nuts, with M points, uh, of function from this class. So this is that characteristic. So we take infimum over points and over weights. And it turns out that this inequality holds. This inequality was used uh, uh, many times in order to prove lower bounds for this characteristic. So because sometimes you know this, but we don't know that. But let me make uh, further remarks, basically repeating what uh, I already was said before uh, in uh, basically in Charlie's talk, uh, that this characteristic is closely connected with uh, recovery. Because if you have a recovery operator, the linear one, which is written like this, so these are function values and these are some functions from some linear subspace, uh, then we define the curvature formula in this way with weights which are exactly integrals of these functions. So if you do that, then the next step will be the following. Uh, the absolute value of the arrow of this numerical integration is written exactly like this because these lambdas in the cubature formula were defined as the, like as a corresponding integral. And then we have this trivial inequality, the integral less or equal than L1 nor. And if, like in our case, the measure is a probabilistic one, so this is uh, bounded by LP nor. So we always have inequality like this. So if you got an upper bound for this, this gives out the upper bound for this and vice versa. This gives the lower bound for uh, recovery. But now the method of recovery. Again, I'm more or less repeating what uh, was here uh, already discussed. Uh, so this is the L2, uh, the least, the weighted least squares. Let's first begin with that. So I use the notation which is no one else is using because it's kind of a bulky notation, but I would like to have in this notation everything which plays the role. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, so what is, the, what is this operator? It is an operator which is assigned to each function f. Uh, let's assume that functions are continuous just for simplicity that we can always evaluate. Then what we do, uh, this operator s is a sampling operator. That means it gives us, it's written here, so it gives us, assigns us all the values of the function which is here at the given points xi. So g here and this g here. And then we take L2 weighted norm with weights w. So these are weights and the squares and square root. So this is by the definition, this is weighted L2, L2 norm. And then the algorithm gives us uh, the one, the u, which uh, provides the infimum of, of, this, of, this, of this impression. So we call this weighted least squares. So it's written here, this L2 weighted, and these are parameters which are here. So C is fixed, the set of points, and our subspace Xn is also fixed. So this notation contains all the information of this algorithm. Sometimes clearly we will uh, use some abbreviation, but anyway, this uh, notation is designed to keep all the information needed. Uh, clearly, this can be also done in not in L2, but in LP, but we will do this later. So, so, and this is just a remark, you can read this remark, but this is in a sense important one, uh, that uh, 
in learning theory, for instance, uh, this is exactly the empirical risk minimization. And it is known uh, that uh, it's there are many papers on that topic. Uh, then in learning theory, when we try to uh, estimate the quality of this operator, uh, then it can be uh, estimated, I mean, the upper bounds uh, can be written in terms of entropy numbers of some uh, classes some characteristics uh, but in the uniform norm in l infinity norm so that kind kind of effect uh, that we are measuring error like here in l2 uh, but uh, uh, in order to get good bounds we need l in l infinity norm uh, this is well known well known in learning here it's also uh, uh, non parametric statistics this is basically the same so this is well known fact so and uh, uh, this is just one more inequality. Uh, this is to make the previous inequality uh, a little bit more uh, uh, informative. So we just introduce this. So remember the definition of the best uh, recovery, uh, we allowed all mappings, but now we have specific one. We have this weighted L2 and these are parameters, points and subspace and also the weight is like a parameter and then at the end, after we take a supremum, we minimize all these parameters, which are in this uh, algorithm. So clearly this gives the upper bound for this row M without any uh, super index here. Uh, and this is what uh, we know, uh, but it turns out that inequality, which was formulated in the previous theorem uh, is actually proved for this particular class of operators. So, and this is now written here. So basically it is kind of a repetition. So, but now in, we are in the, in the. Well, just, what is the L? What is, what is L? What? L, L. F minus L, what is L? L times two. And this is the notation. Uh, this is L, two, W, this is least squares. Ah, so yes, yes, okay. This is this notation. This is least squares weighted uh, uh, algorithm. So it is a notation for the algorithm. Ah, oh. okay, thank you. So we apply these algorithms and we are optimizing only for these algorithms. No other algorithms are allowed in this definition. Only this least squares or weighted least squares algorithms. And the theorem is that we can get, get the same inequality as it was before, uh, but using just these algorithms. Uh, West uh, weighted least squares algorithms, and we get this inequality. So now let me uh, give a proof of that. Uh, first notation Xn is our n dimensional subspace of continuous functions. This is what we always assume. This is what we always do. So n is m is fixed now. And some notations if you have uh, a set of points, uh, these notations, and basically you can read this as the sampling of f at points at all the points c. This is this vector. So this is it could be a complex vector. So this is in cm. So now LP norm, the standard classical one, is written like that. So it's clearly different uh, question of normalization. For us, it is convenient to have this one over n in order to the sum of weights to be one. So this is notation, but. Uh, L infinity, clearly this one, the L infinity norm of this vector. And the weighted one, uh, this is important for us, and you already saw this <coughs> with P equals two is this one. So we introduce now some weights and weights are positive numbers. Uh, at this point, no restrictions ex except that these are positive numbers. So this is a norm. This is the norm on, on, on this uh, CN. CN. Uh, now one more. Uh, notations. So this is the distance from a given function f to the given subspace xn. So this is just infimum of this. So the, the best approximation which could be uh, done using elements from xn. And it is well known, it's a classical linear theory of approximation, uh, that this element of best approximation always exists because xn is a finite dimensional linear subspace. Uh, so there is, there is an operator, uh, not necessarily linear, by some operator, the operator of mapping F to the best uh, approximation uh, exists. So we denote this like this. So this P, this is an element of Xn, and this provides the best approximation in LP from this expression. 
Now it is called, by the way, the uh, Chebyshev projection. So this is kind of preparations. And now uh, uh, we will prove some conditional results, but under these conditions, under two assumptions. So, and the most important one is this. So let's look at this carefully. So we assume uh, that the set of points which we're gonna use for this L2 or LP uh, uh, algorithm, minimization algorithm, we assume that this discretization inequality holds. It's just in one direction. For this theorem, only one direction is needed. So what is that direction? So if we have discrete norm, this weighted LP discrete norm of the function values of U, which is in our subspace at this point C, then it gives us the upper bound so for the norm itself. Another inequality is also non-trivial, but we don't need this inequality. So this is what we require. And in the case of P equals infinity, we require this. So clearly here, there is no W. We can put W there, but it, it, it's, in some notations, we still have uh, W just to write this uniformly for all P, but uh, in L infinity, W does not play any role. So no weights are needed there. So this is discretization assumption. So the discrete norm bounds from above the LP norm. Now these weights, uh, we will need to play with these weights in our proof. So we need the following assumption. This is extra assumption uh, in the definition and the uh, early definition, there was nothing like that, but we need this assumption that the sum of these weights is bounded by some constant. We do know this constant C2, it may depend on this, but anyway, this is just a constant. Uh, the bound which I will prove will depend on these two constants, C1 and C2. But these are uh, our assumptions. So this algorithm, again, I, I, I mentioned this, but in words, uh, now we reply, uh, replace the two by P and get the LP weighted uh, algorithm. So again, this is uh, the uh, vector um, of samples of the difference. We measure uh, weighted LP norm, and then we minimize and get the argument of that. So this is the algorithm. So and this is the remark which I already mentioned. Let me not repeat this. So uh, if P is not two, it may uh, not be linear, but if P is two, it is a linear algorithm. So this is what uh, we have already discussed. So the theorem, in a sense, this is very simple theorem. And it, clearly in this form or in other form, uh, this theorem was used before many times. Uh, but it's convenient for me to formulate this with those explicit assumptions, A, A1 and A2. So if you have this assumption, so let's first consider this case, P uh, less than infinity, so not infinity. So then we have two assumptions, A1 discretization and A2 on weights. Uh, uh, and then we claim that for any F, continuous F, we have this bound. So this algorithm, weighted LP algorithm, which uses this C, the C is from A1, gives us this bound. And Xn is also from A1. So we have this information C and Xn, Xn from A1. So we have this inequality. So that means this bound is bounded by L infinity norm of this, of the distance from F to Xn and L infinity norm. But in the case of P equals infinity, similar inequality uh, holds, but L infinity here. And in that case, you do not even need to wait. We just write like this. Like, right, like this. So let's now prove this. And proof again is very simple. And then I will give uh, this proof in all details. Uh, so, but I will give the proof only in this case. Everybody can do the same with P equals infinity. And as I write here, it's even simpler. But let's uh, do this. Because in this case, the weights will play a role. And P equals infinity, the weights do not play any role. So the arguments, the, 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 uh, the steps are exactly the same. So from the definition, this one is the best approximation of function f in L infinity. So this is from the definition. So this one is equal to this from the definition of this one. So certainly, uh, if you take P and our measure is probabilistic, uh, then we have this inequality. This is obvious, right? 
Now, if you have this inequality, that means this holds for all x in our omega, then certainly uh, this holds for the sampling vector. So if you restrict this to just points xi uh, in the set of xi, then they certainly have this. So now next, now you use the uh, assumption about the weights, because now we want to bound to estimate uh, this sample uh, vector, the sampling vector uh, in weighted LP norm. So we just replace each term by its L infinity, the bound which is there, this one, and we get this easily. So this is at each point, and we have this, and this one, as we already mentioned, this is lesser equal than this one. So we get one inequality. But now the point to use that this one is the minimizer. So it minimizes the norm like this. So clearly uh, we can write this here and it has the inequality if you write any polynomial from this Xn, but we choose this one. Certainly this holds because this is, minim this is the one which minimizes PW discrete norms. So we have this. But for this one, we already got this inequality, right? So that means we got these inequalities. And finally, so just looking at these two, uh, we can say that the uh, sample vector of this difference, the difference of the best approximation in L infinity and our uh, weighted LP minimization is bounded in a discrete norm by this. Up to this point, we did not use the discretization assumption. So, and this is, as you saw, this is very simple. But now this is a critical point in the proof. So now we use this discretization. So now from the discrete bound, the bound of the discrete norm, we get the bound for the LP. And we finish this up. So it's this one, uh, we add this because this deviates from f uh, is exactly like that. So this is this is the proof. As you can see, I mean nothing in that proof. It's very elementary. I mean all this step is either direct definition or very very simple uh, calculations. But in order to prove the original uh, theorem, either inequality uh, one, uh, which was for uh, arbitrary linear recovery, or uh, with a least square uh, estimators, we need something. But we need to satisfy uh, the assumptions A1 and A2. And for that, we need, and this is kind of, this is fundamental theory uh, was developed recently uh, in, in that direction based on the, some deep results um, by uh, Batson, Spielman, Srivastava, and uh, um, Spielman, Srivastava, and uh, uh, other guys, so this is this is uh, important technique which I will uh, uh, comment on at the end later. Now, just let's look at this proof. On the base of those results, uh, the following discretization theorem was proved. So this is the theorem which we proved with uh, Irina Limonova, and then this is the paper published uh, uh, last year in archive. But before even I formulate this uh, theorem, I want to stress that if you are going to apply uh, this theorem, this theorem like it is, and uh, want to connect this to uh, Kolmogorov weights, then we would like to have these assumptions, A1 and A2, but the most difficult is A1, for any subspace Xn. Because we cannot control which one is used for uh, uh, getting the appropriate upper bound for uh, the Kolmogorov weights. So this is why in this theorem, it is very important that this Xn is an arbitrary. And that was a theorem. And it says the following, that if it is an arbitrary and dimensional subspace, it's less say complex, doesn't matter at this point, uh, then we guarantee that there exists a discretization as with the number of points of the same order as the dimension of this space and with this property. So see both of them. We guarantee an upper bound, the upper bound for this and lower bound for this. And this is exactly the discretization which we need, this part, the left inequality in our assumption A1. 
So this is one. So this theorem takes care uh, of that discretization assumption. But we need another one, this A2, uh, which uh, is the assumption about the weights. But it turns out that the generality of this one, and also the important property here, that these are non-negative weights. Certainly, you can uh, think that all these weights are positive because zeros do not contribute anything in here. We can derive from there easily uh, that we can build the weights satisfying this assumption. How can we do this? Exact. Look, this theorem is a very general one because it stands. Uh, it's, uh, it holds for any Xn. So if you are given this Xn, we just modify this Xn a little bit and one more element, that's element one, the function one, and it may increase the dimension uh, from N to N plus one. Uh, but after that, uh, we apply the theorem and we apply this with function F equals one. So there's all these ones and this is one, and this is how we get this C0 prime here, but it's a little bigger class, so it will have an equality like this, but as you understand, uh, this n plus one or n for us, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. So we cover this A2 automatically again from that theorem. So, and this is the proof. Now this is the proof of that theorem. So what we do, we take Xn, which provides, we don't know if this exactly exists or not, but clearly the one which satisfies this exists. So for each, for all f, I mean, we have this. And then we apply that here, uh, that here. Uh, because condition A1 is satisfied because of that theorem, uh, what I formulated uh, from Irina Limono and myself. Uh, and that remark guarantees that A2 is satisfied too. That's it. So this is the proof. Now let's, uh, proceed to some uh, particular examples in order to understand. Uh, and this is very important things uh, in the following sense. Uh, that uh, uh, like you saw, for instance, in the, um, in the talk of uh, uh, Charlie, in some cases, when you go from L2 to L infinity, uh, you can lose for smoothness classes like this, uh, you can lose in the exponent one half. And when we use trigonometric polynomials or some other classical things, uh, this is normal. Uh, you cannot do better. But it turns out that when we are working with uh, Kolmogorov weights, uh, there is a phenomenon which was discovered by Boris Kashin long, long ago, uh, that uh, if you have that flexibility with choosing uh, an appropriate subspace, we can improve this dramatically. We can only lose uh, like log uh, n factor. Uh, but in the sense of classes, if r is big enough, we do not lose even the logarithm part. Uh, but I will be talking about multivariate case. In that case, all these log factors are there. Uh, but anyway, so let me give you now uh, this uh, explicit formulations. So this is known result. Uh, it is in the book of uh, Tregub and Belinsky. So in L infinity, and this class is the class I defined it uh, yesterday. So this is the class of uh, bounded with bounded mixed derivative. It is bounded in L2. And if you approximate this in L2, that there will be a bound without this one half here. So, and this is the right order in L2. But it turns out that we can, I mean, we, I mean, Belinsky proof, uh, the result similar to that, and only one half is L. So we lose only square root of, square root of uh, log n. Uh, it is maybe just an accident, I don't know, but this is exactly that same log uh, uh, n to the one half, which is lost in the formulas, which was given by Mario, for instance, today, uh, comparing to uh, Kolmogorov with this in L2. But anyway, so we are losing just square root of log, log n. So if so, then by this, by these theorems, uh, we obtain this, this inequality. So now we can get the upper bound for this uh, uh, recovery uh, and using this least squares, weighted least squares like this. So, and as, to, as a matter of fact, uh, that was known, and this is what uh, Mario already mentioned uh, in, in, in his paper, and that was paper by uh, uh, Nigel, uh, Schaffer and Tino Ulrich, uh, where they got this, this, this bound. 
by using different methods, using those uh, Kalmogor of in L2 and the corresponding inequalities. Uh, so, and you will hear these talks uh, in our uh, this school workshop. Uh, so I will not go into too much details of this. So the only thing that I will remark, which I will not talk about uh, in my uh, uh, this today's talk, uh, that in some cases, when we are talking about these classes, because here see R is greater than one half. Uh, so we can use this. But as a matter of fact, this method uh, can be extended uh, even in the case of uh, small smoothness. But in that case, it will be not the class WR2, but it will be WRP and P greater than, than two. Uh, so, but in that case, still this method is uh, uh, upper bound given in terms of, uh, Kolmogorov is in L infinity works. So that is a good thing, but I will not comment on this uh, in, in this talk. Let's proceed to another thing, because I, I wanna discuss now, and this is very, I would say, interesting uh, direction, uh, and I don't have, uh, I don't know any results basically in that direction. Uh, so let's do this step by step. Uh, I mean the following thing, that uh, in the Kolmogorov weeds, uh, I will not go back to the definition, but you remember that in the Kolmogorov width, uh, which is important in this theorem, uh, in the, in, like in this theorem, as you can see here for individual function, but then we will apply for the whole class. Uh, so when we, uh, when we work with uh, uh, L infinity norm, uh, then uh, the subspace, uh, we don't know what is that sub subspace and we allow all the subspaces. But in some cases, when we need the discretization theorems, like for instance, this one, uh, we can do better uh, to control the weights because these weights just exist. If you want a better weights, like for instance, equal weights, we need some assumption on this uh, uh, subspace XN. So, and this motivates us to consider a new problem of Kalmogorov weights, uh, or analogs of Kolmogorov weeds, uh, which are obtained by approximating by subspaces with, which satisfy certain restrictions. So this is in a, the direction in which I'm uh, uh, moving now. So let's begin with this class, WR1. Uh, so in this case, just uh, a little known, uh, a little uh, in introduction to the known results there. Uh, so let's consider this problem. This is best M, M term approximation of function F with respect to the trigonometric system. So as you can see here, it is an N term polynomial, trigonometric polynomials, but we are minimizing over the coefficients, what is natural, but also over the frequencies. So frequencies are chosen uh, depending on F. So, and then, uh, this is well studied area, I would say. So one of the results is this. So if you remember this FR, that was a Bernoulli chronicle. So these are the functions with Fourier coefficients, roughly speaking, is like KJ, absolute value, uh, to the minus R and the product over the Js. So for this specific function, and that was the kernel in the definition of this uh, class, uh, we have this bound. We have this bound. Okay, this is the bound. Now, what we say that if so, so if you can approximate in L infinity the kernel, and remember the class, the convolution of this kernel with functions with norm in L1 by, bound, bounded by one, that certainly it gives us the bound for approximation in L infinity. So now we take this Ln, which gives the good approximation for this sigma n, for the whole this, uh, this is just one function for the whole this kernel, and we get this bound, that for, for, all, for any f uh, in this class, we can get this. So we can control the distance. So in other words, this basically is kind of in a step in the direction of Kolmogorov, but now the type of approximation, the subspace which we use is pretty good. We know it. So these are trigonometric polynomials. Uh, frequencies, we don't know these frequencies, but anyway, this is the subspace of trigonometric polynomials. And we got a bound. So, but if so, now we can discretize the special subspaces. And it turns out that for uh, subspaces of trigonometric polynomials, even if you don't know exactly what are the frequencies, 
there is this powerful result holds. So what is that? It uh, claims that in this case, so it's kind of analog of uh, its earlier result and our result with uh, Irina Limonova, uh, but in this case, uh, under assumption that uh, the subspaces are trigonometric polynomials, so like this, and Q is any fixed one, that we can find a number of points, again, uh, uh, comparable to the dimension of this subspace, and we have uh, discretization in L2, but with fixed weights, one over N, equal weights. So, but if so, then we can say the following, that on one hand, this guarantees immediately, uh, like what we already proved, this guarantee immediately this same bound as we got for the Kolmogorov width on the previous slide, as we got this. Uh, but using the specifics of this approximation spaces, we can say that in this case, we can use uh, the least squares, the classical least squares operators. That means the weight is this, is equal weights, equal weights. So this gives us extra information. So now let's keep going in, in, in that direction. <clears throat> uh, but th this is the command, uh, like historical command. We have one half here. But we have a very specific method of approximation, but we got this one half. It turns out uh, that we don't need that one half. So other methods, uh, like remember I uh, discussed uh, yesterday, uh, the small f method. So that method in this case gives us the upper bound without that one half. So exactly like this. So this is what was proved in, in my paper in 1993. And the lower bound is given uh, by the Kolmogorov bounds of this. So we know that this is the lower bound for this. So as a matter of fact, uh, this deviates from the best one by this one half, but the method is this specific one uh, and different from Smolyak's algorithm. Now let's talk a little bit about this H classes, again, which I discussed uh, uh, last time. Uh, in, in this case, again, we can use the Belinsky inequality for the Kolmogorov width. It gives us this bound, and we apply this uh, in, in, in our inequality, uh, and we get this bound, and we get this bound. So again, this is just, just a remark. Uh, but now let's uh, keep going. Uh, and uh, some historical comments, which I tried to make uh, last time too, uh, about uh, recovery or exact results, exact exact order of recovery for the classes with mixed smoothness. So not very much is known, and I refer uh, uh, everybody to uh, this uh, book. It is a book, but it's more like a survey book, uh, and uh, my book, which contains all the proofs uh, for further information in, in that. Uh, but one of the results is what I mentioned last time is this one. Uh, and is to exact uh, orders, I think this is the only one. That means for H classes, when P is equals to infinity and D equals two, we know this. In all other cases, it is an open problem. What is the right order of this one and the same one with W instead of H? We don't know, we don't know. And now this further commands. And this is what I al already mentioned, but let me uh, make this more precise. Now I uh, would like, there are some reasons and special reasons and with which I will not uh, go into uh, details uh, to consider uh, like discretization or lift, uh, least squares with specific weights with uh, one over m what equal, equal weights. So now let's see what can we do using just this specific least square algorithms. So as we understood from the previous results, uh, the weighted least squares algorithms are pretty good. So we can get an upper bound in terms of uh, Kolmogorov with an L infinity. But what if you want to restrict ourselves just to these kind of weights? That means classical least squares uh, algorithms. Could we do something? It turns out that yes, we can do. Uh, but in that case, we need to uh, introduce a little bit more restrictions. So this condition E. Uh, this condition is very similar to the condition which Charlie discussed in, 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 in his talk. It's kind of a, in a more specific form uh, about the Christoffel function. Uh, but let me just use this notation as it is. Uh, so what is that? If you have an orthonormal system, uh, then you say that this system uh, satisfies this condition E, which depends on parameter T. It's just a parameter T fixed one. Uh, if this inequality holds, 
in discretization theory and this discretization of L2 norms, uh, this condition appeared in the very first papers about that, in the paper of Rudelson, which is like 30 years ago. So this is a classical condition, but it is a condition. So, and under this condition, uh, we proved uh, with Irina Limonova in that same paper, and this EW stands for equal weights. So we proved the following version. So if you assume that the subspace, which is spent by this orthonormal uh, system, uh, which satisfies, and this doesn't matter real or complex, satisfies uh, this condition E, that means this one, for instance, in particular, let's just think about this, is all of these are uniformly bounded that it is automatically uh, satisfied. Uh, but not necessarily uh, uniformly bounded, any which satisfy this condition, then you guarantee uh, that there is a discretization formula with equal weights, which provides us uh, this Martin-Kevich or Martin-Kevich Zygmunt inequalities. So both of these. So what is important is compared to uh, the previous uh, theorem of Irina Limonova and myself, which I formulated, here we have the specific weights, one over n. But in that case, that same argument which we already used can be applied. But in that case, instead of Kolmogorov weights in which we optimize over all subspaces and we apply the discretization theorem which works for all subspaces, now we can allow ourselves to optimize only over those subspaces which satisfy condition E. So, and this is written here. So now we introduce a variant of the Kolmogorov weights. So in the Kolmogorov weights, there is no restriction. So this infimum overall is U1, UN. But in our case, we it impose an extra restriction on these functions that it satisfies this. So then we get <coughs> this concept. So see, certainly this is greater or equal than the Kolmogorov weights, because there are no restrictions and here is a restriction. But if you can estimate this one, then we get the following result. So now for any class, which is a compact subset of this, uh, we have this inequality. And here there's not weighted least squares, but just least squares. That means all the weights are one over M and we have that same inequality. But instead of the Kolmogorov weights, it stands the Kolmogorov weights with the condition. With the condition, this ET. And uh, to my opinion, it, it would be very interesting to understand uh, for slight, like classical classes, how does this thing behave? Uh, because as you know, uh, like for instance, for those classes, even in the univariate case for Sobolev classes and other stuff, uh, this Cushion's technique, it is basically a probabilistic technique. So, this technique allows us to prove that there is there exists a good subspace but how to construct that good subspace and what are the properties of that good subspace we don't know but maybe it's possible to get something uh, uh, to estimate this one well it may happen that nothing can be done and the best what we can do is like for instance in a periodic case like to use a trigonometric system but anyway i think it's an interesting an interesting direction to walk so now some historical, some historical remarks about this, this, uh, this techniques used. Uh, and I think it is an important, it's at the, at the end of my talk, but I just want to give some sort of uh, orientation in that. In few words, this will, this will be as follows. So uh, we exist like an approximation theory. This is our field, but there are many other fields around. And one of those is a finite dimensional uh, uh, Banach spaces. And uh, there are very deep and very, uh, a uh, nice result proved, uh, and in, in particular uh, by uh, Purgen uh, and Linden Strauss and Milman, this paper, which we use a lot in discretization, uh, Batson, Spielman, Srivastava, and Markus Spielman, Srivastava. These are two fundamental uh, papers which we use for discretization, uh, and so on. But uh, and as you understood from my talk, the key point basically in proving those results for uh, uh, function classes with mixed smoothness uh, is the use uh, of the discretization. Well, we use that inequality, but it is heavily used on that uh, deep result 
about discretization. So let me uh, talk about this a little bit. Uh, and uh, as to more detailed things, those who attended uh, that summer school uh, in Chemnitz two years ago in 2019, which Tino Ulrich organized, now I gave a series of lectures about that, about discretization, and I discussed in detail how these methods, which were developed by Batson Spielmann Srevastava and Markus Spielmann Srevastava, uh, were used for discretization. Uh, but anyway, now briefly, I will, I will do that. So this is the fundamental theorem which basically proved uh, the cadison zinger problem. So this is a little different area, so different notations, but uh, let me go all of this because everybody can understand this easily. So what we are talking about now, uh, in this space here, there are a lot of vectors. M is usually much bigger than M. But, so there is a lot of vectors. And what we assume about these vectors is that this is a tight frame. So this condition is exactly the tight frame. So the, if you imagine, this is the tight frame. So if you have this condition that uh, for any individual W, it's almost obvious if this uh, vectors are small enough, then we can split this summation into two groups, such that each of these groups will be more or less one half of this. For each individual W, it's obvious under this assumption. But the point is, and the whole power of this theorem is that it turns out that we can make that splitting universal. So this is the whole power of this of this of this theorem. So ex explicitly, this means the following. And there exists a partition of uh, this summation into two sets, S1, SS2, such that for all W, for any W, we have this property. Because then we have this for Bohr's, that means we can write this upper and lower bounds for this sum. So basically, roughly speaking, the half of this in each, but for any W, not what shall go this specific, but for any W, we have this. So, and this is why it is so, it is very, really very deep and powerful result. And this is why it uh, brings us uh, some serious improvements. So then this, this uh, theorem uh, was used uh, in the paper by Nidza, Nalewski, and Ulanovsky. Uh, they studied discretization too, but in a little different uh, setting, not like we do, like Martzenkevich, Martzenkevich, Zygmunt inequalities. Uh, that is more like an infinite dimensional case. So they don't care about cardinality. They care about like sampling and a different form. But anyway, they needed this lemma uh, and they proved the fault. So if those vectors in that frame satisfy this uh, and satisfy this, this, this previous condition, so this is 12, so this is tight frame. And in addition, this one, uh, then we have this. Then we have this. So that's for all, all this, then, then, then we can we have this. So what is important here? Uh, they did not uh, say anything about the cardinality of uh, this J, but it's kind of easy to derive from their result. Uh, but what is important here that uh, now see we have a discretization, but we use much less number of the indices. So it is a subspace. It is a subspace, it is a subset of this, and we still have this kind of discretization. So that was, but uh, what was important here in, in this proof that uh, they use this uh, uh, assumption that the norms are the same and are equal to this. So M is, as I said, much bigger than N. So these are small. So we have this. And it turns out uh, that this result uh, can be generalized. It's not very difficult, I would say, but still it's kind of uh, important, uh, important observation uh, that if instead of equality, we write inequality here, uh, but still we assume that, you know, that this is a tight frame, uh, that we still have that similar, uh, similar discretization. Uh, and this uh, J, this, uh, this is what we needed in our paper uh, that we can uh, get an upper bound for uh, cardinality of this. So basically, if you look at this, what's going on here, like in this lemma, if you have some properties and M is huge, doesn't matter how big this M, but it is huge. But then we can choose a subset, uh, which is of order N, that is, this is what we are interested in, let's say, and 
have a discretization like this. Say, have a discretization formula like this. So, and this, this result, uh, we needed this result for discretization. Uh, but it turns out that for other applications, for applications in uh, like recovery or direct application, I would say in recovery, uh, a little stronger version that that, that theorem uh, is needed. Uh, but actually, in 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 the proof of this uh, lemma in our paper, which was uh, published in archive, uh, instead of this assumption uh, that it is a tight frame, uh, the proof went like this. So the first step in the proof was to replace now this tight frame assumption by another assumption that this is just a frame, and then the proof goes. So that was proved there, but. This form, this we did not need that uh, version for discretization, but it turned out that this version of discretization is useful in in recovery, and that was used, for instance, in the paper by Nigel uh, Schaffer and and, and Gino. So now uh, one more remark, uh, and because I want to uh, pay uh, a kind of tribute to. Uh, Boris discussion for introducing, uh, for bringing that paper to us. So what was the starting point of all that? Because as you know, we existed like in uh, approximation theory with discretization technique, which you know. And uh, uh, I discussed these uh, issues with Boris discussion. And he uh, brought to my atten attention that paper by uh, Nidzan, Alevsky, and Olanovsky, where they proved uh, uh, this uh, lemma. And I realized that indeed this lemma is uh, very good, very useful in our applications. Uh, and as a result, I proved that theorem which I formulated for the trigonometric polynomial. And later it was developed, and uh, we talked about this uh, with, in, in, in my laboratory, and uh, for instance, with uh, Irina Limonova. And she came with that uh, uh, version, what I just formulated. Uh, so uh, one more point here is uh, this is what uh, I'm I'm talking here that uh, about uh, arbitrary and uh, arbitrary subspaces and subspaces uh, with restrictions. Uh, so as to those lemmas which I just mentioned here, all of this uh, and both of it basically this lemma and this lemma, because of this assumption, basically this is what uh, this assumption. Uh, these assumptions are, in a sense, equivalent to this condition E. And this restricts the application to exactly those spaces. Uh, but uh, as you know, in order to improve the inequality with Kolmogorov width, uh, we do not allow ourselves any conditions. It must be arbitrary. But it turns out that there, there was a technique uh, developed, for instance, uh, in that paper by uh, Jean Bourguin and Lyndon Strauss and Milman, uh, where they used a technique which is called uh, the uh, change of density. And that technique allows us to go from the uh, space with some conditions, exactly like this ET e condition, to an arbitrary subspace. So this is what, this is what uh, we used. Uh, and uh, in, in our paper with uh, Irina Limono, we used another way. Uh, uh, we did not use that, but this can be used too uh, and uh, get these results for uh, general subspaces. So, and basically, and uh, this is a comment, you can, you can read all this, but I think basically I'm done. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Volodya, for a nice talk. Are there any questions, remarks? Maybe I start in the, in the time the audience is uh, thinking. Um, you showed this example with the WR1 spaces, where we know that you are, that the sample, that at least the proof you have and the upper bound is off by the log factor compared to the optimal result that we know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any idea why this is the case? So is it, we had this discussion in an earlier talk, do you think it's, about the point set somehow, and it's a random thing, or do you think it is based on the method? Uh, I think uh, the, uh, my understanding of that uh, is, is the following thing. Let me uh, come to that class here, yeah, this one. Uh, this, see, this, uh, this proof, which gives us this one, right, with this extra one half, 
uh, this goes through L infinity because we use the Kalmogorov, uh, not in this case, the version of Kalmogorov, but anyway, we use the approximation and this is exactly what uh, we did here. We use the approximation, uh, oh, okay, let me stay here. The approximation of that class of the Bernoulli conon in L infinity. And when we do that, I don't think, uh, I mean, we can get rid of uh, one half. So on this way, on this, in this method, I think we cannot get rid of this one half. So this is why we, we get that. But it turns out but that- you, you said that's a, that's a matter of proof, right? Yes. So because you said you, you're going over the proof, but do you also think the method cannot do better? Or do you think- Ah, um, you, you mean the method, not the proof, but you mean the method, this uh, yes. list squares? Or I don't know. This is what I don't know. Because in that case, see, with this method, there are uh, several ingredients. Uh, one of those, and the most important, how to choose these points. So here we choose those points uh, using the discretization theorem, but for that subspace, which basically comes from the Kolmogorov written L infinity. Uh, but I don't know other approaches. Uh, maybe and probably, uh, let, me, let me think. No. I'm not quite sure, but maybe if we use, uh, but no, let me not, the, the second thing what I would uh, try to check is, as you see, the upper bound here is given by the Smolniak algorithm. So Smolniak algorithm provides us this uh, sparse, sparse points, but uh, in that case, the algorithm is very different. There we have positive, negative uh, coefficients and so on and so on. I'm not sure, I don't know. For instance, if someone applies the uh, least square uh, algorithms with weights uh, uh, like one over n, uh, what will be the result? How good it will be? I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. So are there other questions? Yeah, I have a question <clears throat> or comment, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so, um, it should be pointed out that um, the, if you compare the result where you bound the uh, uh, sampling numbers by the Kolmogorov numbers on the one hand, and you compare the sampling numbers by the Kolmogorov numbers in L2, so the other approach, uh, that in the second one, you kind of know the subspace where you do the least squares, right? So as you pointed out in your talk, um, when you do the Kolmogorov comparison, your subspace is kind of completely unknown. You know, it, it exists somehow, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but in the other result um, where you, yeah, that one probably, yeah. So there you know that the subspace is actually the hyperbolic cross. So in a sense, it is a bit more constructive, but still you have, a randomness involved and you have this this uh, Nitsan Olevsky Ulanovsky subsampling uh, so in the constructive but at least you know the subspace where you work on yeah thank you Tina yeah I think this is yeah I did not uh, uh, have time to, co to to comment on all these things but yeah this is a very important point and I have a, a second comment yeah um, you pointed out this interesting question about these modified Kolmogorov numbers uh -huh. where you did this condition E of T uh, additionally in the definition. Yeah. So this is uh, actually quite interesting for uh, my collaboration with, uh, with Katarina Pojaska mm -hmm. because there um, we studied the L infinity approximation. And once you would know something about the subspace like this condition E of T, or you would know um, the Christoffel function of the subspace, um, which is optimal for the Kolmogorov numbers, then it would give you um, a corresponding result for the L infinity approximation. So that is what we also have in mind as an open problem to kind of study this modified Kolmogorov setting where you additionally try to control um, the Christoffel function of the subspace, which is kind of optimal for, for this error. So yeah, in that I sense, um, we, we, we had the same um, kind of feeling that this might be a, a useful concept 
Exactly. Yeah, I think it's very natural because now you can see that, uh, for instance, like in my case, uh, in order to get uh, the equal weights 1 over m, you cannot get this for free. You need to sacrifice something. But in that case, this condition E. But in your case, it could be something different. But yeah, that means there's too much freedom when we uh, evaluate the Kolmogorov weights. But clearly, this is why we get uh, that, that good uh, bounds. Uh, but maybe we can. Uh, restrict ourselves and still have pretty good bounds. This is kind of interesting uh, issue. Yeah. And uh, is it time for a third command, maybe? Oh. Mario? Or sure. sure. Maybe a, a, another one wants to ask a question and... Uh, no, um, please, you know, continue. Otherwise, we just... Um, as you mentioned several times, actually, um, the result, the, these, these uh, new results here are based on this very deep um, Kettison Singer type theorems. Yes. But as, as you know, this um, uh, first paper by Batson, Spielmann, uh, Srivastava, um, that contained a weaker result. So it is not equivalent to Kettison Singer. It is, um, they say at the end of this paper, once they would control these weights in their uh, theorem, they would solve the Kettison Singer theorem, right? But I think that all of this can be got out of this Betzen Spielmann Srivastava paper. So actually this uh, say big canon of Kettison Singer solution is probably not needed for all, for all of this. Well, uh, this is my Tina, this is written explicitly. This is exactly what 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 uh, yeah let me let me kind of repeat this again. So uh, uh, how we can prove this. So if you are talking about uh, if we are talking about uh, this uh, domain inequality, that means the recovery bounded above by Kolmogorov weights. In that case, we use that uh, general discretization theorem, uh, which I already formulated, but general for any, for arbitrary subspace XM. So there are two versions of that, real and complex. So the real version uh, was derived from the Batson, Spielman and Srivastava paper, in our paper with Feng Dai, Andrei Primak, uh, Alexei Shadrin, and Sergei Tikhonov uh, in 2020. So we do not use uh, Marcus Spielman, Srivastava, the solution of Kadison. Just this paper, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava. So this is one way. And then the complex case can be, can be obtained from this or can be obtained in the, in the, in the independently. Uh, but anyway, so. Uh, as to the main the theorem, it is indeed based or could be only based on uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava. However, in our paper with Irina Limonova, we give another proof which does not use Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, but only uses uh, Marcus, Spielman, and Srivastava and still proves that same result. So at this point, we have two proofs for that general discretization theorem. One is solely based on Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava. And another proof is solely based on Marcus, Spielman, and Srivastava. So certainly, probably, somewhere deeply, uh, they probably have that same kind of ingredient, the same kind of root. But formally, uh, now we have these two uh, different proofs. Yeah, I mean, so in that sense, you're absolutely right in that feeling. So th this is an interesting uh, fact. I mean, uh, for this uh, bound with the Kolmogorov numbers, I mean that um, say that fact that you need some some say constructiveness is not so relevant, because I mean your subspace is kind of just an existence result. But for the other result, right, um, where you where we know the subspace, it could be really relevant to get it out of this uh, Batson Spielmann Srivastava for two reasons. One is that there is an explicit algorithm how to downsample. It's not just this uh, this frame dividing thing where you know the existence and you iterate this. It's really an algorithm how to build up this matrix. Yeah, I mean, still you have this random component, but in any case, uh, it is an interesting point if you really need this equivalent formulations of the Caddison Singer theorem for for this type of results. But uh, following what you just said, uh, Tina, I would uh, add the following thing. So one thing uh, that is to Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, uh, their, their result is proved 
for the omega, which is just finite number of points. It could be any, if there is new omega m, it could be any, but it's fixed. This is just the number of points. And in that case, the algorithm is absolutely deterministic. It is a greedy type algorithm. So they don't use in their proof, they don't use any randomness. That is true. It, it is a proof. But then when we uh, extended their results, like in this, our paper of uh, this Feng Dai and Ray Pramat and uh, Losha Sadrin and Sergei Tihan, we extended this to arbitrary omega. And in that case, we needed uh, randomness. We needed the argument from other results, which kind of allow us to extend. In that case, yeah, we did. We, we do have some, some randomness. But originally, as I say, in Watson, Spillman, and Srivastava, there is no randomness. That is, that is true. That is true. But if you use it, you kind of combine it with a random procedure. Yes. Yes. And that is that is the fact. So you cannot get completely rid of the non-constructiveness. Yeah. Exactly. But what concerns okay. this final step of reducing uh, the the sampling budget? There, this older paper is a bit more accessible in that sense that you get an algorithm out of it. Yeah. Yeah, but nevertheless, it's interesting that you, um, uh, yeah, that, that you noticed this fact. So it, your result is can be completely based on on Batson, Spielmann, Schriver, Stella. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I would think we could postpone this discussion, although it's strange to um, interrupt the two organizers. <laughs> um, are there any other questions of the of the audience? Okay. So if not, then. Let us thank all the speakers again. Thanks the organizers. This was a nice meeting and we see us tomorrow. Um, and the last comment from my side, I think we will just let the meeting open for guys who still want to chat a little bit or whatever. Um, and otherwise see you tomorrow in the morning in the talks. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you very much. And yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah, thanks for the talks. Everybody who talked today. <laughs>